Uh, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Athenaeum. Uh, my name is Bruce Laverty. I'm the curator of architecture here. And one of the best parts of my job is I get to pick out uh, wonderful things that go on the walls uh, <laughs> downstairs. Uh, and uh, and the, the most recent exhibition, uh, Philadelphia Portraits of a City, um, certainly does not, uh, does not disappoint. Um, and so uh, I'm glad that uh, you're here. How many of you are first time visitors to the Athenaeum? Okay, good. Uh, we hope that you feel welcome here and uh, we do hope that you'll come back. Um, the Athenaeum uh, now has hours on Saturdays from, uh, from 10 until 3. Uh, and uh, Sean and some of his friends uh, were here on Saturday uh, with a group called Urban Sketchers. You don't have to sketch if you come here, but you're welcome to do so. Not just Saturdays, but any of the days that we're open. Um, I wanted to make a plug for this absolutely gorgeous book, uh, Philadelphia Portraits of, uh, of a City, uh, which is available for sale uh, both downstairs uh, as well as upstairs after the program. And Sean has uh, graciously, um, graciously agreed to, uh, to sign uh, copies that you, you purchase. So take, take a look at the, uh, this and, and buy yourself one and a couple of other people uh, one as well. Uh, Sean O'Rourke uh, was born in Cleveland, Ohio. He received an architectural undergraduate degree from Virginia Tech in the 1980s, and he studied in the PhD program at the University of Pennsylvania, receiving a, an MS in architecture in the 1990s. Uh, Sean has practiced and taught architecture for over 30 years in Philadelphia. Uh, throughout his career, he has written and presented on architecture, planning, and urbanity across various venues. He lives in the 30th Ward with his wife and son. Sean? You're gonna stay up there, Bruce? I'm gonna stay yep, up here. Yep. <laughs> thank you so much, Bruce. And um, first of all, thank you to the Athenaeum for inviting me and to the staff and Beth and Christina who's working in the back. Second of all, I have 50 slides to show you tonight and I'll read during them going to take about 25 minutes and I'd like to just introduce this before we start. That's why Bruce is going to press a button and then it's going to run. I'm going to apologize for a couple reasons and I'm sorry I'm not going to read from the book tonight. It's a wonderful book. I love it but I have a couple reasons for not reading from it. If you read the book already I'm not sure I'm going to add much to your experience. You either liked it or you didn't. My rereading it to you isn't going to change this. If you haven't read the book, I don't want to ruin it for you. <laughs> we didn't put the photos and the stories on a website for a reason. We like the notion of the book, the fact that you turn the pages, the weight of it in your lap on a table. Looking at the photographs going, oh my God, they're beautiful. Reading it going, what? What's this got to do with the photographs? Hopefully what you experience tonight may either help you appreciate what we we're thinking when we did the book or make you want to read it. And both of those are good things. Second apology, this isn't a lecture. I still have to read it as well as I can and I try, but tonight may be less explanatory than expressive. And I'm sorry if that ruins your expectation. I'm going to read from back here. You're going to enjoy the slides. And so what am I doing tonight? I want to read about a couple of themes. Photography, storytelling, the notion of place, and bringing these things together around a city. Jerome's images of Philadelphia in the slideshow, the book and the show below, Lots of people have thought and written about these themes. The texts that I will read tonight are mostly other people's words about these themes. They wrote what I thought or think better than I can or could have. So I want to share them with you. The line of thought might not be too linear or straight, maybe more like a circuitous collage. Follow along as well as you can. When it gets too boring, Look at the photographs. There is one story in the readings that didn't make the book. I didn't write it, but I think you'll enjoy it and you'll recognize it as a story. 
And the photographs are all Jerome's. They're from the book. There are a couple of panoramas in color that are not in the book, but in this archive. And some of Jerome's portraits. Unless the portrait is of you, the portraits might be the first time they've been seen by many people. And thank you to Jerome's executor for letting me share them with you tonight. I wanted to see what would happen putting them all together and asking you to look carefully and enjoy them. Okay, just wait. When you're ready. There's no such thing as a reliable narrator. There's more reliable and less reliable, but any light that passes through that lens is shaped, bent, divided. You willingly create distortions, and those distortions are misleading, designed to stir you up, revise, reverse, undo, shift, shape, sing. A story is an interrogation, an act of aggression, a flirtation. It's slippery, squirrely, and rascally. How to establish the exact moment in which a story begins? Everything has begun before. The first line of the first page of every novel refers to something that has already happened outside the book. Or else the real story is the one that begins 10 or 100 pages further on and everything that precedes it is only a prologue. The lives of individuals of the human race form a constant plot in which every attempt to isolate one piece of living that has a meaning separate from the rest, for example, the meaning of two people, which will become decisive for both, must bear in mind that each of the two brings with himself a texture of events, environments, other people, and that from that meeting, in turn, other stories will be derived, which will break off from the common story. Human beings are storytelling creatures, craving to see the crumpled metal in the closed off highway lane, working from the moment the traffic slows to construct a narrative from what's left behind. But our tales, even the most tragic ones, hinge on specificity. Before the book, the Philadelphia book, Jerome was known for his portraits of people. The work he shared were his portraits of beautiful women, of Grateful Dead concert goers, CEOs, Beaux-Arts Ball attendees, and many of us, and our children, anyone that he could get to sit still for him. He made us all look better than we are, or he made us look like we imagine we should. It was an uncanny ability to get behind a camera and sublimate his rather distinct personality in service to the sitter. It was a gift, his gift, and in the Philadelphia book, he extrapolated this skill to buildings in the city he grew old in, Philadelphia. It is purposeful that the book is titled Portraits of the City because in time, he went beyond the individual building portraits to something more interesting. His photographs of Philadelphia were beautiful portraits of singular buildings, details, multiple buildings, and the spaces and conversations between them. As portraits, they suggest a physical character and personality and urban demeanor that whatever I could write about didn't really do them justice. It was a profound artistic leap for him that I watched him take. A story is really a way of thinking, perhaps the most powerful and versatile skill in the human cognition repertoire. The world confronts the mind with a myriad impressions. We needed a way to organize this overwhelming torrent of information. 
to pass a multiplicity of experience through a reverse prism and distill it. Authors are curators of experience. They filter the world's noise, and out of that noise, they make the purest signal they can. Out of disorder, they create narrative. They administer this narrative in the form of a book. Putting together a book is interesting and exhilarating. It is sufficiently difficult and complex that it engages all your intelligence. It is life at its most free because you select the materials, invent your task, and pace yourself. The obverse of this freedom, of course, is that your work is so meaningless, so fully for yourself alone and so worthless in the world that no one except you cares whether you do it or do it well. I have a face, but a face is not what I am. Behind it lies a mind which you do not see, but which looks out on you. This face, which you see, but I do not, is a medium I own to express something of what I am. I could examine the ways in which it defines my nature, setting down a record of it. The city has a public face and a body, a tactile physicality of form, material, spaces, that behind it lies a personality. A photographic portrait tries to reveal this character by presenting how the light reflects off of what we see. I had stories, stories that by narrative could approach from perhaps a different direction the same notion of a portrait. This isn't a new idea, a book of photographs and texts that together tries to portray somewhere as a place. If all art can be said to be autobiographical, at least in a symbolic sense, these photographs might best be termed self-portraiture because a camera generally binds the photographs to the moment observed. Even the most casual viewer should be able to discern from a picture where a photographer has been by looking at what he or she has seen. But the seasoned reader of images learns to go beyond simple descriptions to the visual dialogue also recorded. Call it the moment felt. Photography is a serial art. It rarely produces single images that are worth the proverbial thousand words. But photography, to transcend its apparent subject, and realize its deeper strength of being such a superb instrument for relating the teller's tale, time must be slowed, not stopped. Photographers have another resource in addition to the viewfinder for making sense of the pulsating life in front of the lens. They can order the photographs themselves, arrange them in sequence, compose them in certain ways, perhaps attach written text to express a particular meaning. In some cases, the meaning seems imposed by the text, by juxtaposed captions or narratives. In others, it seems to arise from the images themselves, from the dialogue among them and between them, and the viewer's own experience. In all cases, the relation between images and meaning is fraught with uncertainties. Images cannot be trapped readily. They have a life of their own. The more I think of it, I find this conclusion more impressed upon me, that the greatest thing a human soul ever does in this world is to see something and tell what it saw in a plain way. Hundreds of people can talk for one who can think. Thousands can think for one who can see. To see clearly is poetry, prophecy, and religion all in one. Of the many definitions of a story, the simplest may be this. It's a piece of writing that makes a reader want to find out what happens next. Good writers, it is often said, have the ability to make you keep on reading them whether you want to or not. The milk boils over, the subway stop is missed. Strong narrative writing at its most elementary is an act of seduction. It arouses curiosity and interest and expectation. It flirts with the reader stimulates an appetite, verges on satisfying it. But also, stories protect us from chaos. We need stories. They're a fundamental unit of knowledge, the foundation of memory, essential to the way we make sense of our lives, the, the beginning, the middle, and the end of our personal and collective trajectories. 
In the beginning and end of all literary activity is a reproduction of the world that surrounds me by means of the world that is in me. All things being grasped, related, recreated, molded, and reconstructed in a personal form and in an original manner. <clears throat> Thoreau thought that places spoke that they express themselves in a language which all things and events speak without metaphor, which is copious and standard. And maybe we agree with them, some of us, so that when we read a book or see a photograph which, we, which contains, we think, a sense of place, we understand the writer or the picture maker to have heard that language and somehow infused his objects with it so that we can know it too. That, we would say, is his genius. He is a listener to a language only he can hear. But I would say against Thoreau that places, mountains, street corners, skylines, do not speak, have no essences which can be captured, heard. They are intransigent, mute, specific, and that is enough. Likewise, if I look at a photograph taken on a street in Memphis, a rainy blue-green day, the corner of a tall brick house, a lawn, an oak, a magnolia in silhouette, a shiny driveway pavement leading away, and I say, yes, this has that sense of place. It's my sense I refer to. My sense feels as if it is an important event I'd somehow forgotten had occurred there, and this composition of image Colors and all brought it flooding back. Something, some sense I didn't know I knew, had been awakened like a reverie. And my sense of place, of course, will not be yours, though we both know that street so well, both of us being Memphians. If we agree this picture has a sense of place, we stress the similarities, neglecting the differences, relying on the adaptive, sympathetic capacities of another language to accommodate each other's views. We need to make it up between us, establishing a feeling of community over the issue of a photograph we like and a pictured place which actually doesn't require us. It's only human, of course, to think we recognize a place this way, some intimate part of it we believe we've known but not articulated. Life with others depends on such reconciliations and we are likable to the, set, to the extent we are suggestible that our imaginations can be engaged and that we connect. The photograph photographer cannot, like Turner, whisk an invisible town around a hill and bring it into view and add a tower or two to a palatial building or shave off a mountain scalp. He must take what he sees just as he sees it and his only liberty is a selection of a point of view. I read this, it was written by Reverend Morton in the Philadelphia Photographer in 1865. Obviously, he never had Photoshop. <laughs> At our best and most fortunate, we make pictures because of what stands in front of the camera to honor what is greater and more interesting than we are. We never accomplish this perfectly, though in return, we are given something perfect, a sense of inclusion. Our subject thus redefines us and is part of the biography by which we want to be known. To portray a city as it is with a woman or a man is beyond any ending and becomes a grave conceit to begin. For though the portrayal may achieve its own measure of truth, it still will be no more than a rumor of the city, no more meaningful and no more permanent. I'm not a scientist, I explore the neighborhood, an infant who has just learned to hold his head up has a frank and forthright way of gazing about him in bewilderment. She hasn't the faintest a clue where she is and she aims to learn. In a couple of years, what he will have learned instead is how to fake it. He'll have the cocksure air of a squatter who has come to feel he owns that corner. Some unwanted taut pride diverts us from our original intent, which is to explore the neighborhood, view the landscape, to discover at least where it is that we have been so startlingly set down, if we can at least learn why. How do people imagine the landscapes they find themselves in? How does a city shape the imaginations of the people who dwell in it? How does desire itself, the desire to comprehend, 
shape knowledge. Without the application of some kind of knowledge, I would not be seeing the place at all, just drifting through it in a mist of ignorance and unachieved indifference. Thought's danger and its chief merit is its tendency to displace the world's noisy immediacy, no observation without involvement, no fact without interpretation. One can lie on the ground and look up at the almost infinite number of stars in the night sky, but in order to tell stories about those stars, they need to be seen as constellations. The invisible lines which can connect them need to be assumed. No story is like a wheeled vehicle whose contact with the road is continuous. Stories walk like animals or men, and their steps are not only between narrated events, but between each sentence sometimes each word. Every step is a stride over something not said. The story becomes a story because we're not quite sure, because we remain skeptical either way. Life's experience of itself, and what else are stories if not that, is always skeptical. Skeptical comes from a word that means to look. A skeptic is someone who bothers to look. In practice, photographs observe us. This gaze, that of the photographer and that of the beholder, closing a circle aimed not solely at the contemplation of a subject, the documentation of a fact, or the creation of a work of art, but more broadly at the production of knowledge. At the base of this convert of this lies a sort of inexhaustible trust in vision. In consequential, its excess necessarily leads to some kind of understanding. If photography allows us to see better, then it also allows us to understand better. If place does work upon genius, how does it? It may be that place can focus a gigantic, voracious eye of genius and bring its gaze to point. Focus then means awareness, discernment, order, clarity, insight. They are like attributes of love, the act of focus, which itself has beauty and meaning. Indeed, as soon as the least of us stands still, that is a moment something extraordinary is seen to be going on in the world. We have needed a shared sense of measure in order to create pages which flow. A book has to advance on two legs, one being the images, the second the text. Both have to adapt to the pace of the other. Both have to refrain from repeating what the other has already done. Revelations don't come easily. Appearances are so complex that only the search, which is inherent in the act of looking, can draw a reading out of their underlying coherence. If, for the sake of temporary clarification, one artificially separates appearance from vision, and we know that's impossible, one might say that in appearances, everything that can be read is already there, but undifferentiated. It's a search with its choices which differentiates, and the scene, the revealed, is a child of both appearances and the search. In every act of looking, there's an expectation of finding, an expectation of meaning. This expectation should be distinguished from a desire for explanation. The one who looks may explain afterwards, but prior to any explanation, there is the expectation of what appearances themselves may be about to reveal. A story's outcome, outcome like coming out of a house or residence, coming into the street, traditionally the term refers to how a story ends, to finally what happens, to the protagonist, tragic, happy, whatever ending. It can also refer to how the listener or reader or spectator leaves the story to continue their ongoing lives. Where the story leaves those who have followed it and in what frame of mind they are. The answer to this question may depend upon what the story has uncovered or revealed or its moral imperatives, if it has included one. But there's another more interesting answer. We follow the trajectory of a storyteller's attention, what it notices, what it ignores, what it hinges on, 
what it repeats, what it considers irrelevant, what it hurries towards, what it circles, what it brings together. It's like following a dance, not with our feet and bodies, but with our observations and expectations and memories of live life. Throughout the story, we become accustomed to the storyteller's particular procedures of bestowing attention and then making a certain sense of what was at first glance chaotic. We begin to acquire her storytelling habits. And if the story has impressed us, something of these habits, something of its way of giving attention will remain with us and become our own. We'll then apply it to the chaos of ongoing life in which multitudes of stories are hidden. This inheritance is what I mean by a story's outcome. Yet if we imagine the stories being told and consider their outcomes, I believe we'll find two main categories. Those whose narratives are emphasizing something that is hidden and those which emphasize the revealed. I don't know whether photographers find it in the world or when they look through the viewfinder or whether they work in the dark room or on the computer screen. But the effort is calling together of all the elements of an image so that the photograph feels like it is both prior to the act of seeing and the act of seeing. Attention is prayer and form in art is the way attention comes to life. One man, here's a story, sorry. One man has stood apart from the fray, keeping his distance from the going-ons at 22nd and Bainbridge for 35 years. His name is Johnny Wellborn. The name and the events of a sunny spring morning in 1960 are woven indelibly in the history and literature of the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ of the Apostolic Faith. According to the literature, and by his own account, Johnny Wellborn was killed on the morning of April 15, 1960, and was brought back to life by Bishop Sherrod Johnson. Wellborn was 24, working on a row house roof on Pemberton Street across from the church. A roll of tar paper was being hoisted to the roof. Wellborn leaned out over a tripod to pull it in. With a sudden crack, the tripod broke. Wellborn lurched forward. For an instant, he wobbled on the edge of the roof, flapping his arms like a bird, trying to pull himself back. Then he fell. He hit the sidewalk head first. He remembers a moment of hor or horrible, excruciating pain. Then, hit the, then the pain left him, he says, and he could feel himself dying. It's a feeling you're possessed, like you're in a straitjacket. You can no longer move, and then you just fade away, he said. The workmen around him were sure he was dead, so sure they didn't even call for an ambulance. His body was completely still. He wasn't even breathing. Someone ran to get Bishop Johnson at the parish house across the street. The man known as Thunderbolt strode to the place where Wellborn lay. He knelt on the sidewalk, put a hand on Wellborn's chest, and began to pray. One of the bystanders heard a strange sound come from the bishop's mouth and saw a flash enter Wellborn's body. Lying flat on the pavement, Wellborn says he could feel himself come back to life. I began to take form, I became, my feet became real, my body real, like I was being created. He heard the bishop's thundering voice, he's going to be all right, and he opened his eyes and returned to life. That's the story as Johnny Wellborn tells it today and as he and other witnesses recounted it 35 years ago. Wellborn is 60 now, a tall, slender man who stands ramrod straight and speaks in a soft, deep voice. He earns his living as a carpenter working on housing rehabs in West Philly. He believes with absolute certainty that he died that morning in 1960 and that Bishop Johnson, through prayer, brought him back to life. It was like most other miracles. It happened, he says. We know it happened. God knows it happened. Nothing was done for show. Not long after Bishop Johnson died in 1961, Johnny Wellborn left the church, disgusted by the successor, Bishop Shelton. He never lost his faith. To this day, he still worships, listening to a taped sermon of Bishop Johnson. Cities, like dreams, 
are made of desires and fears. Even if the threat of their discourse is secret, their rules are absurd, their perspectives deceitful, and everything conceals something else. A book is completed only when it's finished by a reader. This is the ultimate privilege of art. In fact, it's the intimate privilege of being alive. When telling stories or sharing photographs, we are engaged in a democracy like no other. Perhaps an o a book only begins after a reader finishes it. I can try and answer questions. Uh, he and I were good friends. Um, I don't, Rick, do you know his years? Yeah, when was he born? And um, I met him, my wife and I met him in the early 80s, mid 80s. Um, I, I think it generated from the sense that uh, most of us who knew him 
knew him through his portraits and he did beautiful work and eventually he came to the city and I made this theory that somehow he was able to translate the skill of making all of us look better than we are um, to do that with the city. And he sort of, the nice thing was it went from, that's a ugly building made beautiful or that's a beautiful building made even more beautiful to, oh my God, those are two buildings. Oh my God, those are spaces between. So it was even better than his portrait. And um, I wanted to test the theory of being able to look at the, we, how people look at faces and how they look at uh, buildings. Did you did you find that jarring? That's correct. <laughs> there's something going on back there. Yeah, and, and honestly, um, there's a couple pieces where I talk about Jerome that I wrote. The story was from the Philadelphia Inquirer from the 90s that um, I forget who wrote that. And all the other things are from people who I, like I'm no longer in the academic world, so I have no obligation to cite who the authors are, but they were people that I've read over the years and things. Uh, it, it's a short story and a long story. So um, when I was in the academic world, I was writing about my neighborhood and the experience of sort of um, living in that uh, thing. And I was giving an academic paper down in Virginia Tech and I convinced Jerome because I didn't own a car to drive me down there. And we made it a road trip. I presented, he sat in the audience. And then on the way back, he, he's like, maybe I could take photographs of your neighborhood because I had nothing, no visual aids for my stories. And he, um, I'm like, go for it, I'd love it. And he took photographs and they were ugly. And we both knew it. It was like, oh, this doesn't work. And then he went away. And eventually, I think that caused him to look at photographing the city. And he went away and he took photographs, not in my neighborhood, just of the city. And after a couple of years, he showed those to a variety of people. And it's like, these are beautiful. And he made a larger and larger body of work, I, 2000 or whatever in the archive now. And eventually he came back to me and he's like, I want you to write about these. And I'm like, I, what's there to say about them? But we found a way that, and we found models of other books that did this that could not talk directly about what the photographs were. And, and we um, together collectively created this sort of stories and explanations, some that refer to the photographs and some that don't and his photographs, and, and we thought that it was a great pairing. Um, n not really, though my affinity to what I sketch, I love his photographs for some of that stuff. And I'm now going back to the photographs he didn't take, and I'm trying to sketch those. <laughs> like there was always a constant dialogue. He's like, what else should I look at? And I'd go, go there, that's a great photograph. Or go, and sometimes he'd go and he'd be inspired and he'd bring back a photograph that wasn't the one I imagined, but he got it out of that visit. There are other ones where he came back and he's like, yeah, that, there was nothing there. And, and, and so then now I'm going back to those places and I'm like, well, I'm going to sketch what I thought was there. 
but to that extent, they're not his photographs. Michael. Yeah, in the earlier thing when um, Professor Williams was here, he called them like chocolate pastries, and I was thinking about them as, you know, they're just thick. They have a very, uh, uh, they have a gravity or weight to them that allows you to stare at them for 30 seconds. You go, I'm not bored. I'm still looking at them. It, it's probably the themes that I hold closer to my heart. Um, he was not, and for people who know Jerome, he was not an explainer about things. So he'd do something and he was happy for other people to talk about it, but you couldn't get him to tell you why or how, or you know why there instead of here. He was very much, it, it is now. Do you like it? Do you not? Why? Okay, but it is. Um, but as we talked about the book, um, those themes that I read tonight were consistently brought up between us, and he was and I were on the very same page to go, you know, we're, you, Jerome, you don't want me to have someone explain why this photograph's beautiful or the history of the book, and he's like, I don't want you not to include these stories, you know, even though they have nothing to do with them some of the photographs, or they do in very oblique ways. Mary? Yeah, and Mary, I think you're being um, kind to Jerome. He was a little bit of like that pain in the ass trickster. <laughs> True, that for anyone who was very close to him, there was some saturation point where you're like, okay, I can't stand you any longer. I, I think the photographs are beautiful in some ways because the sense of humor, even in the portraits and all, there's a sense of dignity to it. it. There's no, it doesn't come at the expense of the building, whether it's Chick-fil-A or the naked guy with the duck. There's a certain amount of dignity there that you could still smile at. And I think that is very telling in his um, photographs. In real life, as we know who knew him, he was a pain in the butt at times. And it, it could be a little bit too much, and, and he wanted and liked that energy while some of us were not. So I think it's to his credit that the artwork he created, those photographs, um, he had a restraint to that, and uh, he could bring out a dignity in things that would cause us to laugh or smile and still go, I'm not laughing at you, I'm smiling because it's still so beautiful or honest or... Yes, I, I think um, 
Jerome was well read and he was like he had been in the photography world for a long, long time. So he knew what was going on. And we spent a lot of time uh, shopping the book as an idea, trying to find a publisher who wanted it. And so there is always this, well, it's sort of like this, or this is popular, or let's um, you know, present this to so-and-so or submit this. And uh, to the design advisory groups, DAGs, credit, and David Brownlee, he recognized the photographs and stories when we sent him some a couple years ago, and he published those photographs and stories next to him on the DAG website, which was wonderful. Most of the things that Jerome, in trying to publicize his work and he'd submit to for competitions, he wasn't very successful. And I think for some of those reasons, it, it, he was out of sync. But I think if you pushed him, he'd be proudly out of sync, right? He'd be like, this is who I am and everyone else is wrong about that. A and um, you know, that, that was okay. And I don't think he ever, though, however well read he was and knew what was going on in photography circles. And even with the panoramas, he was pushing himself to experiment, but it wasn't always in terms of, well, this is what's trending. This is what's hot. I want to do that. He sort of uh, did his own thing and played with his own thing. And, and he didn't seem that... Um, that it mattered whether he was in sync with what was trending or not. Yep, yep, and it wasn't like we purposefully waited. Like, it, it took a long time, and I, I think we were, um, we were patient, and I had a day job, so it was like, I'm not spending my entire uh, fortune of time to do this, and I can wait, and Jerome was, I wanna take more photographs, I don't wanna go out and try and sell this book, I just wanna photograph more. And so there was, um, that patience came out of being distracted by my day job as an architect and everything else. I think the patience of feeling like we had a good product and like we just needed to find a home for it and if we didn't find the right home, we'd try and control it ourselves was critical. But we weren't, you know, for five seconds, Jerome thought he'd be rich because of the book. But I think everyone <laughs> was like, no, dude. And he was okay with that after that. So I don't think anyone was looking at, you know, we can't wait for that bedroom to open or the gymnasium to open. We were patient about it. Yeah, you, you, you're as good a judge as I am. I, I will tell you, um, because someone had asked before, did Jerome take interiors of buildings? And he did not. Like one of the things I think that's special about this book are all these photographs are done from where you and I could look at, the, look at them. And so they were outside, they were in the public realm. In certain times he rode his bike around, other times with a car and photographed with you and I and everyone else sees on a day-to-day -day basis. So he never went into buildings to do that. And I think it gave him a certain amount of autonomy and power to pick and choose, you know, wait for the daylight and everything else. But the, um, the inside and the portraits that are really face-oriented and being faces, you're absolutely right, but your interpretation is as good as mine.
uh, um, if you look carefully, and we can go through there, Mary, there's a lot of people in them. But there's not, they're never the reason the photograph is taken. Somehow they're there, and they're secondary to the uh, photograph. And it's not like every photograph has a person in a fine wall, though. But there's actually more in the photographs than you and I first assume when we look at them. But you're right. He was very, very careful and calculated about um, not making the photographs about people in the city. A and yet, the more you look at it, the more you do find people in there. But it's always sort of sublimated to an overall scene of a building or whatever. It's, uh, and it's funny because I think of the city, you know, cities, and especially Philadelphia, is designed to the scale of us. Like, it's a colonial city. It's really got a great scale. When you look at Jerome's photographs more and more, the, the photographs are heroic, and the people are there, but they're, they, it's not the same scale. And it's funny that he did that. Sven. So it, it's a great question. He and I um, did a dummy book, and we called it 28 Views. And he and I, and he picked out his 28 views, and I may have said, what about this one? And he exchanged one or two. And I had 28 stories, and we made ourselves a small version of it to test the format of it. Can it work with print and photographs of this size? And that was the first um, sort of dummy that we did. And there are subtle things. We realized that the text needed not to be black, that it became too dense and it argued with the photograph on the other page. Jerome didn't want any paid photographs to go over the fold. So we tweaked it in that book. And then um, uh, when we found the publisher, the publisher, Oscar, came to Philadelphia and he's like, I want to see the photographs that you had. And Jerome laid out hundreds printed on the thing. And he went through and he picked out 200 and he's like, I want to use these. And probably 100 of those were the ones that Jerome and I were like, fine. And like I was just another opinion in the room. Eventually, we convinced the Oscar to reduce that to about 125 or however many are in the book. And then it was a, and he was okay with that. He gave us a tremendous amount of autonomy once he had picked out 200 and said, I want a book of 200. That was fine. And he didn't fight us with any of those. And then um, there was just a lot of back and forth with Jerome and I in trying to create a sequence because you have the photographs and the way you go through them, and then it's like, well, that story goes with this one. That story doesn't. That one does. And the one brilliant thing that we came up with was understanding that that 28 views was a, uh, almost like a stride. It, it was a good length. So the book is divided into chapters for arbitrary reasons, but it's about 28 to 30 images with stories. And so you could go and stop and look up and go, I'm looking outside now. Maybe I'll come back, or maybe I won't. And we also looked at sequences where you know there are two photographs on a page or a photograph by itself. But most of those things we controlled, and Oscar, on occasion, would come back and go, I don't think we like this. But he gave us a tremendous amount of autonomy. Yep, and, and um, like I said, he was down at Virginia Tech, heard the thing, which was even wackier than this, because I had sketches of Europe with these stories, and like that really didn't align. So he had heard those stories, and he liked those. And then when he created enough work to come back and go, I want you to write for this, it, initially he's like, I think you should write things for this. And as we talk further and further, I think he realized that wasn't the correct notion. 
And then as we looked at other books about how you pair writings and photographs, I think both of us realized this could be a viable model, that you didn't need the one-on-one. -on -one. And there are some cases where Jerome's like, I think you need to say something about this photograph. And he studied in Iowa at the creative writing thing, so he was editing mine. I'm not a writer well. And he, um, he was all over those, and it was sort of funny, the back and forth. But at no point did he ever go, I don't want this story or this explanation in the thing. He, as similar to, I thought he led with the photographs and he had a great sense. I think he sort of felt comfortable enough by that point to let me do what I thought was right for the stories. Yep. Yeah, and, and I, I'm not a photography uh, expert, but he was very, very critical about daylight. When you look at the way that he controls those skies in a black and white, it's unbelievable. So it was never a case where, yeah, I just went out and took photographs. Like he was always walking around with a camera, taking photographs quick, and then going back with the four by five and setting up and I imagine more than once or twice because you can't take some of those photographs without you know, waiting for the right sky or waiting for the right light. So I think he was very, very careful about those things and very um, calculated. Thank you.